Good morning. Good to see you. I pray once again that you are doing well, uh, that you have been trusting the Lord and walking with him, uh, talking with him in prayer and spending time in his word. Uh, we need the Lord desperately each and every day. My prayer is that we would not take him for granted. In fact, that's part of what Peter is emphasizing to us here in our passage today in 1 Peter chapter 3. We've reached a really crucial part in this book. Peter has said a lot about how we are to relate to one another and the importance of living a holy life as those who belong to Jesus Christ. And now he is really tying everything together. How are we to live as those who belong to Christ, as those who are holy in a world that is so chaotic, so evil, and often seeks to bring harm to us and to others? We're going to be reading here uh, in verses 8 through 22 of 1 Peter chapter 3, as we're reminded that we have nothing to fear in this world. Let's read together. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit, through whom also he went and preached the spirits in prison, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Let's thank God for his word and pray together. Lord, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to your word in each and every way, that you always keep your promises. Remind us, Lord, today that we can trust you. Remind us, Lord, that no matter what, may, uh, what evil may have been done to us in the past or what harm or evil might lie before us, that no matter what we may be experiencing or going through, we can trust you. We don't have to be afraid, for we have a blessing, an eternal inheritance, and a life and identity in you that is sure and secure. I pray, Lord, that I would not get in your way during this time, but that you would speak. Have your way with us, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well... People in general are usually prone to take the people that mean the most to them for granted. Now, I, I don't pretend to fully know or understand why, but it seems that those whom we truly count on day in, day out, we also often fail to appreciate 
value and love in an appropriate manner. Not always, not all the times, but we seem to be prone to drift in that manner. You know, as believers, though, we first typically fail to appropriately appreciate, value, and love God. We take him and his blessings of life and salvation for granted day in and day out. You know, we, we've seen in these last few weeks, in these past couple of chapters, that we belong to Christ. We belong to God. We are to be holy as he is holy. And we cannot afford to take him for granted. Because who we are is fully wrapped up in who he is and what he has done for us. And the reality is, is that if we do not truly value God and value our salvation in Christ with the infinite and eternal worth that he truly possesses, we are going to struggle with everything that Peter just set before us in that passage that we just read today. Because B Peter is beginning with the, uh, the presupposition, the assumption, the premise that we as believers value Christ above all else and most of all. For it is only when we truly value God and our identity and life in him that we can ever live in the manner that scripture is calling us to here. In fact, verse 8 begins with really a, a summary of how our relationship with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ should be. Relationships of, of harmony, of peace. Meaning we as Christians, as believers, as the church are not to be a divided and factitious group, ever in conflict and easily agitated with one another. But instead, we are to be sympathetic, meaning we take the time to know and understand one another, to care for each other, and to invest ourselves in one another's lives. We are to love one another in Christ like brothers, like family, with all compassion and humility. Now hear me on this, church. These kinds of relationships that are truly marked by this kind of, of peace are impossible in any setting, including the church, apart from Christ. I imagine if you've been a believer for any length of time, you've been in a church that has had issues with peace, that has been divided, that has faced bitterness, gossip, and division. But you see, as believers, the only way we're going to live in the manner called to here is if each of us truly values God and our relationship with him above even ourselves. Because it is only when our eyes are fixed on Jesus that we are able to see those around us the way he sees them, through the lens of his word, his will, and his desires for them. But if we are taking our Lord for granted... I assure you, we will ultimately take one another for granted too. And if we cannot come to value the Lord and those whom he has given us uh, in the church, truly loving them as he has called us to, well, then we're really going to have a, a hard time blessing, loving, and showing grace to those who do not know Christ and those especially who might consider themselves to be our enemies, who seek to do evil against us. For this is really the heart of this passage. How are we as believers and followers of Jesus Christ to respond to individuals in this world who may seek to, or maybe who already have, done us harm? Remember, it's one thing to respond lovingly to those who love us, care for us, and help us. Of course we are to do that. In fact, Jesus pointed out in Luke chapter 6 verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Uh, those statements alone should be quite the indictment on the church, which, as we often fail to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. But this gets even more challenging when we're called to love those who oppose us, who inflict evil upon us, who do not know Christ. And if we struggle to love those who love us, Wow, do we really struggle with loving those who don't. You know, Jesus repeatedly in the Gospels called us to love our enemies. Seems to be a common uh, point in his teaching. And Peter is echoing that teaching here while explaining its implications for us. 
When someone harms us, our response as Christians is not to inflict harm in return. But literally, we are called to pray that God would bless those who may torment us. In fact, Peter emphasizes that this part of our calling in Christ, to bless those who curse us, begins with recognizing that in Christ, we are already set to inherit a blessing. In other words, once again, Peter is pointing out the fact that we will spend eternity with Jesus Christ, and that this eternity with Jesus Christ and the life and salvation we have in him is the reason and the motivator for us turning the other cheek and showing grace to those who bring evil against us, responding to injustice not with vengeance or violence, but with a desire that those who harm us would come to know the blessing of forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life, which we already possess in Christ. But make no mistake about it, this flies in the face of what the world calls human nature. The normal human response to injustice is retribution, not grace. It's judgment, not blessing. We struggle, I struggle, and constantly fail to, well, to even desire blessing for those who may simply cut me off in traffic. Not to mention desiring eternal life and blessing for someone who might actually truly be seeking to harm me or my family. So how do we reach such a point? A point of truly loving our enemies and desiring what is genuinely best for them. Well, it goes back to where we started. Do we truly value God and his salvation with the eternal worth that he and our salvation actually possess? Or have we so taken our own salvation in Christ for granted that we do not recognize his true power to address all sin, to defeat all that is wrong in our hearts and in this world, and to bring life to that which is dead? You know, I can't truly love my fellow believer like I've been called to unless I see them as Christ does. And likewise, I certainly uh, can't love my enemy like I've been called to unless I see them as Christ does. As a sinner in need of redemption. As one whom Christ so loved that he was willing to die for them just as he died for you and for me. You see, church, what we truly value most of all will be directly reflected in what we love and what we fear. And thus will determine what we live for, how we respond to the people and the circumstances that challenge us most of all, who may seem to threaten us in our possessions, in this physical body, this tent that we have been given for our time on this earth. If we value ourselves and our things most of all, well, we will certainly fight to defend them. But if we value Christ, his salvation, his name, and his life most of all, then our hearts will be set on honoring him before protecting our bodies and our stuff. You see, in verses 10, 11, and 12 here, Peter quotes from Psalm 34 to remind us of the life and the calling that we have been given. The true life and good days mentioned in verse 10 are nothing other than the eternal life and future inheritance we have in Christ. This is the life and eternity to which we have been called and to which we belong. And the point that Peter is making here, and the point made in, verse, or in Psalm 34, is that if this eternal life in Christ, the only life that is truly good is the life to which we belong and live for, then why would we lower ourselves to the actions, the attitudes, and the ambitions of this world. It's not what we're destined for. Why, when shown evil, would we desire to respond with the same? Christian, we have been saved from such things. We have been set free from sin. We know that sin and evil only lead to death. Why would we be so eager, or immediately desire, to rush headlong into that which we have been delivered from? And why would we desire evil on anyone when we ourselves have been so blessed to have been saved from the very foundation of evil and sin 
because of the grace of our Lord. Scripture reminds us here that the Lord is attentive to the righteous, meaning God is present with and working through those who live and walk in his ways, in his righteousness. But the Lord stands opposed to those who do evil, those who prefer to live in sin and who are eager and willing to sin against others. So why would we as the church, as those who belong to Jesus Christ, who have been saved from sin, assume that it is appropriate to wish evil upon anyone, including those who have harmed us when we have been shown such grace? Did Christ wish evil upon those who were crucifying him? What did Jesus say about those around him when he hung upon the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Why did he say that? Because he knew the realities of sin. He knew the realities likewise of life and righteousness and truth. And scripture is clear that he came and died to save sinners, not to destroy them. Guess what, church? In Christ we have been given and shown the realities of life, righteousness, and truth. And the Lord has not left us on this earth so that we can go and promote ourselves or bring vengeance upon those who have harmed us or anyone else. The Lord has not shown us this grace so that we can inflict judgment on others. And likewise, the Lord does not need us to defend him in any sort of physical battle in this world. The scripture is clear. God is more than capable of taking care of himself in his great name. He is God after all. But we are here as believers and as the church to show the love that has saved us, to offer the grace that was offered to us. The good news of Jesus Christ is to be presented through us to a world that is trapped in sin, just as we once were. And when we rightly value what Christ has done for us, we will begin to correctly understand why we are here. And thus we will be able to glorify God in the manner in which we graciously seek to show the blessing of Christ and his salvation to those who may even see us suffer. Verse 13 here asks the question, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? Now you might respond, well, Peter hasn't been watching the news recently. There seems to be lots of people out there willing to harm others who well, just are minding their own business or even doing what you know is good. But I believe Peter is looking beyond just what the world considers good in this statement. He's trying to get us to remember the bigger picture. Remember, who alone is truly good? God alone is truly good. And if we are eager to do good, then we are eager to live for God and to honor him above all else. And if we are living for the Lord and we are his, then what true significant harm could ever come to us? If we belong to him and our salvation in him is secure, then what do we have to be afraid of? What do we have to fear? For who we are and what we value most is eternally secure. Remember what Paul asked at the end of Romans chapter 8? He said, If God is for us, who can be against us? And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then at the very end of the chapter he said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For just as Peter says here in verse 14, even if we do suffer for what is right, we are blessed. And we are blessed with a blessing that can never be taken away. Thus we should not fear as the world does. We should not be afraid of the things that overwhelm the capacities of this world, because who we are and what we have been given cannot possibly be overcome by anything. Not anything in this world, nor even by anything beyond this world. So the key then for us as believers is found in verse 14, or verse 15, excuse me. But in your hearts, 
set apart Christ as Lord. This goes back to what we discussed a few minutes ago. Are we taking Jesus for granted? Do we value him as we should? Is he truly the Lord of our hearts? Is Christ truly set apart? Is he truly the Holy One of our hearts and minds? Or is there something else we value more than him? Something else with authority over our lives as Lord instead of him? See, when faced with evil, our first conscious intentional response needs to be Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the Lord of my heart, my life, my being, and he is worth more to me than anything else. If we fail to set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts, then we will ultimately fail to turn the other cheek, to show grace and to desire the blessing of eternal life for those who seek to do evil. You see, verse 15 also calls us here to be ready to give an answer. An answer for what? For the hope, the hope that we have in Christ. See, once again, there are some assumptions made there that as those who belong to Christ, who have set him apart in our heart as Lord, that the very hope of our life would be found in him, in his eternal salvation, and not in this world. There's the assumption that his hope is going to be evident in the way in which we conduct ourselves, in the manners in which we respond to those who live in sin. Because guess what? If that hope isn't evident in our actions, our attitudes, and our ambitions, I assure you, Christian, you probably won't have any questions to answer about it. But when we respond as those whose hope is in Christ, who value Christ and eternal life in Him more than even our own lives in this world, people are going to have questions. And we should be ready. More than that, Scripture implies we should be eager to gently and respectfully give the reasons for this hope that we have. Because remember, if we truly desire blessing for those who seek us harm, then what greater blessing is there for them than the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Thus, when others seek to harm us, our heart's desire should be for their salvation. So when they ask us about this hope, our hearts should thus then be ready to share the good news of this hope and salvation with them. You see, church, being ready here ultimately isn't about memorizing a five-point gospel speech or a series of tactical scriptural rebuttals. Being ready is about having a heart whose hope is truly in Christ alone. Remember, Scripture has told us in Acts that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, will give us the words to say when we need them. We don't have to worry about what exactly we might say, but we do have to choose to set our hope firmly on Jesus Christ. And Peter's desire here is that we as believers would keep a clear conscience, meaning we would not stumble into sin by allowing worldly attitudes to take root in our heart, that we would not allow the fear in this world to lead to violent action, nor our anger to lead to spiteful speech, nor pain to lead to bitter hearts. We should not suffer because we have done evil, but if we do suffer for doing good and seeking to honor the Lord, then frankly at such a point we come to understand all the more the sacrificial suffering that our Lord endured for us. And we relate to him, our Savior, on an even deeper level. And this is why Peter reminds us here of the cross, of the suffering of our Lord, which brought life and salvation to us. Jesus was resurrected, and so will we on the day of our Lord. And we will join him in glory. Now, as we read this passage, you may have noticed there were some things in verses 19 and 20 that may have sounded a little strange. And verses 19 and 20 here present the most controversial verses in this book, as well as some of the hardest to interpret. There are no less than at least, at least, 18 major theories that have been proposed by serious evangelical theologians on the best interpretation 
of these verses. No, I'm not going to cover all of them today. Instead, I want to allow the context of this passage itself and what we confidently know in Scripture and have already discussed here to interpret these verses for us. Verse 19 tells us that after Christ was raised to life again through the Spirit, he went to preach to spirits that were imprisoned. Spirits, Scripture says here, that had disobeyed God long ago. And then Peter jumps thoughts connecting all of this to the days of Noah and the few in his family that were saved from the flood. Now, the only imprisoned spirits mentioned in Scripture are demonic spirits, not the spirits or souls of people. Jesus wasn't preaching to dead people to give them a second chance at salvation, as some have suggested. He was preaching, which literally means proclaiming, his victory over death, over sin, and over all demonic spirits and authorities. For Scripture is clear that when Christ rose from the grave, every enemy of God in this world and in all existence of the spiritual realms was soundly defeated. Point being, if Christ has proclaimed victory over even the demons, then who is left for us who belong to him to fear? For we as believers then, Peter suggests, are akin to Noah and his family. Just as Noah faced a hostile, sinful world of violence and suffering, Genesis says, yet he maintained his faith in God, building an ark entirely at God's direction by faith for a coming flood that he had never experienced, could not relate to, and could not see. And Peter makes a comparison here between the symbolic nature of the waters of the flood and our baptism as believers, which is a pledge, a response of faith, to the salvation from sin that we have been given in Christ. Like Noah, we haven't seen the day of Christ's return, but we have his word assuring us of it and of our eternity with him. And so like Noah, we continue to trust God, having been baptized, belonging to God, and living for him, knowing, knowing that God will fulfill his promise. We know that by grace through faith in Christ we have been saved, and that we will spend eternity with our Lord, who even now already our Savior sits enthroned in heaven with every angel, authority, and power in the universe falling down in submission before him. If our eternal destiny is found in the glory of his victorious presence forever, what is left for us to fear in this temporary world? What remains in this world to control or dictate our attitudes? What temporary suffering could be so great as to draw us away from such a hope that is so incredible and sure as this? What yearning could possibly be greater than the blessing of seeing the glory of God expand as sinners repent of their sin and place their hope in the very same salvation that we now live for? Brothers, sisters, let us not take Christ for granted. Let us not minimize the nature of our own salvation to such a degree that we are willing to stoop to the bitterness, the anger, and the violent retribution that has so ensnared this world. Christ has promised us that one day he will come, and he will bring justice and judgment. The book of Revelation is clear on this. He will set all things right. And we can entrust ourselves to him, knowing that as Lord and judge, Christ will bring an appropriate vengeance to those who are destined for it when he comes in judgment. But today, today, scripture says, is the day of salvation. Today is still the day of hope. And we are called not to add to the curses of this, war, this fallen world, but to be a blessing. A blessing of God's life, God's love, grace, and salvation to others. Holding out his hope to those who are hopeless and who desperately need his life. Is this your heart today? To be a blessing of life and salvation? Even, even in the face of and through the means of suffering? 
all for the sake of Jesus Christ, in whom your hope is found. Church, we are called to love one another. We are called to love our enemies. And this is possible only if Christ is truly set apart as the Lord of our hearts. Is he the Lord of your heart today? Are you willing to do anything and go through anything for him because of who he is and what he means to you? May we be a blessing to this world which desperately needs the blessing of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we confess our weakness, our tendency to respond to sin, to harm, to pain, to things that we frankly just don't enjoy with a worldly attitude, with an attitude of desiring to take control and bring vengeance and retribution to those around us. Forgive us. Forgive me. Lord, may you truly be set apart as Lord of my heart. Grant us the courage and the humility to honor you above all else, to not take you and your salvation for granted, but to truly live in a manner that values you for who you truly are. Grant us the peace that comes only from your presence, that comes only from knowing you and trusting you, no matter what may be going on around us, or what has happened to us, or is being done to us, or even what may lie before us. May our faith be like that of Noah, as we eagerly look forward to the day of your return. Thank you, Lord. It is in your grace and your name alone that we stand, Jesus. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ and be a blessing to others for his name's sake.